Welcome. You want to help me with the announcements? Uh-huh. No, you don't want to help me? Uh-huh. Welcome one and all to our special Christmas service. It's going to be a little different from how we normally do things today, but I think you guys will have a phenomenal time. We are going to kick off with some announcements. We have a video queued up to promote our Lottie Moon offering today. You know, to us, evangelism and discipleship isn't just like one hour a week meeting with them and doing a Bible story or going through a scripture. To us, it's, it's spending life with them. It's living with them, being there with them, and then sharing scripture with them, keep sharing the truth with them. come to the city from the villages, they immediately are looking at in the face of the reality that they are invisible in the city. So the women are out there begging on the streets and people are walking by them constantly. They don't see them. They don't even acknowledge them. They don't talk to them. And so I think God's really opened up a door for us to come into their lives and see them. So we see their needs. We don't look at them as some invisible person or some number or some project. We look at them as made in God's image and people that deserve to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So we started a project to help us gain access to the Embarrer people and this project helps them provide jobs and it gives us a reason to be among them and spending time with them so that we can share the gospel with them. So there's one lady that we met through our ministry and she's really a leader among the community and we were able to start meeting with her and her family and start sharing the Bible stories with her. We would go visit her every week and we've just been faithfully sharing with her for over three years and finally about two months ago she decided she wanted to give her life to Jesus and we were able to baptize her in her community in front of the whole community and she's able to testify what God has done in her life. The hope would be one day to be able to see Embera missionaries be sent out to their villages and share the gospel, share the God stories with people so they can have enough information to follow Jesus. We just want to thank you all for giving to the Lottie Moon offering because without that we wouldn't be able to do what we do. We're able to focus on our ministry. We don't have to worry about raising support and we're able to really just dedicate all of our time to sharing the good news with people who have never heard. Today is the collection day for that. If you are able to give to Lottie Moon, there is uh, a separate basket in the back. Uh, your donation will go towards sharing the gospel around the world. So if you're able to give, please do so. Uh, a couple more things. We have our membership class upcoming next month. So if you've never become a member here and you would like to, please come and see me. We'll be kicking that off uh, sometime after the holidays next month. Our Christmas Eve service is this year on Christmas Eve at 7 p.m. right here at the church, 7 p.m. I won't keep you too late because you'll all be back here the next morning for Christmas, right? Right? Well, I'll be here. <laughs> uh, Christmas, though, uh, our service is at 11 a.m., no Sunday school. Uh, 11 a.m. service, there is also no Sunday school for the following Sunday, which is New Year's Day. So uh, pretty much keeping the same schedule, though, for the most part. Uh, now I'd like to invite up Mr. Al for the Advent reading and the corporate prayer.
Thank you. Our scripture for today is, For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 This is probably the best known verse in the Bible. John 3.16 is flashed in ballparks and memorialized in Sunday school classes. Why is it so beloved? Because it tells us about God's love, the reason that the Father sent his Son on Christmas Day. He gave his one and only Son that Christmas morn. Why? Because he loved the world so much, not the physical globe, but the people whom he had created. Struggling, confused, exuberant, depressed, striving, and sinful. He loved them. He loves us. That is why Jesus came. In the way Jesus relates to hurting people, we can see that love, that compassion. His gentle words, my daughter, to the woman who touched the hem of his garment. The encouragement to Peter, who had betrayed him. Feed my sheep, Peter. I haven't given up on you. His compassion for the crowds whom he saw as sheep without a shepherd. Jesus came on Christmas morn out of the <clears throat> Father's love, and in spite of that persecution and crucifixion, even a history of saints and sinners inside and outside of his church, his love for us is undiminished this Advent season. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for your undeserved love that envelops us and saves us, that fills us with your spirit and includes us in the momentous plans of your kingdom. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A long time ago, a young woman named Mary lived in a village called Nazareth. One day, the angel Gabriel, sent by God, appeared to Mary. The angel said, You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. You will give birth to a son and call him Jesus.
Mary married a man named Joseph, who was a carpenter. One day, Joseph had to go to a town called Bethlehem to pay his taxes. Mary went with him on the long, hard journey, even though it was almost time for her to give birth to her baby. Would you please join us in singing A Little Town of Bethlehem? Joseph arrived in Bethlehem. It was crowded and they looked for a place to stay. They approached an inn. I'm sorry, there are no rooms left. Please help us. My wife is about to have a baby and we need a place to stay. You can stay in the stable with the animals. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph led Mary to the stable where she gave birth to a baby boy. Would you join us in saying Away in a Manger? Nearby there were shepherds in a field watching over their sheep. During the night, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and they were afraid. Go away, we are afraid of you. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. A child is born today in Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You'll find the babe wrapped in swine clothes and lying in a manger. The sky filled with angels saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Look in the sky, angels. Let's go to Bethlehem and find the baby the angel told us about. The shepherds went to Bethlehem, where they found Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus, just as the angel said. Would you please join us in singing Silent Night?
Soon three wise men arrived in Bethlehem. Where is the baby who is the king of the Jews? We have been song the star and baby. We want to give him gifts and worship him. I brought the baby frankincense. I brought the baby gold. I brought the baby myrrh. The birth of Jesus brought hope to many people. He grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with both God and men. The Son of God is sent to save all those who believe in him from their sins. Joy to the world! Would you please join us in standing? Would you please stand in joining us in singing Joy to the World? Thank you again for being here. I'd like to share with you a little bit about the reasons for Christmas. Now, it's important that we know as believers exactly what it is that we're celebrating this Christmas season. You know, is it about gifts? Is it about giving and receiving gifts? Is it about special decorations? Is it about special Christmas music? Is Christmas primarily about quality time with loved ones? Not primarily. The true reason, obviously, that we honor and celebrate Christmas is because the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He took on flesh. He came to this earth as fully man and fully God. In accordance with what God had told us beforehand, He lived a perfect, sinless life. He gave His life on the cross, and He changed our world, and He changed our lives for all of eternity. And that is really what we're celebrating today. 
John chapter 1, verse 14, is one verse that encapsulates this entire truth perfectly for us. The Apostle John says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You've probably heard that expression before, the Word became flesh. The Apostle Paul, in his writings, he picks up on this and he builds on it and he says, the wonder of Jesus' life is that he willingly and he voluntarily left the splendor and the glory and the wealth and the riches of heaven. He left that. He came to this earth. He became poor for our sake. And he says, in Jesus becoming poor for our sake, we can then become wealthy in his name, spiritually wealthy by gaining eternal, eternal life. The Apostle Paul would also go on to say that Jesus' coming to this earth was a humbling of himself. He humbled himself. He took on the form of a servant. He humbled himself to the point of death. Scripture says even the death of a cross. Now, for what purpose did Jesus do all this? Well, I believe that there are four main reasons that Jesus came to this earth, and accordingly, four reasons that we should celebrate with joy this Christmas season. First thing, Jesus came to this earth to reveal God's love to us. He came to this earth to reveal God's love to us. One of the miracles of Christmas and one of the main purposes of Jesus' life was to reveal God's love in a way that we had never experienced it before. You know, this is part of the reason that we celebrate Christmas. This is part of the reason that it's so special. You see, throughout all of creation, Scripture says, by looking at the natural created world, you can see God's attributes on display. Romans chapter 1 says you can, look at, you can look at nature and you can see God's power. You can see his divine nature. You can understand these things by looking at how God has designed the world. He's also revealed himself in Scripture. You see, in the Old Testament, God reveals himself to us as the lawgiver. He reveals himself to us as the judge. He reveals himself as the redeemer of his people. We get to know these attributes of his. But what is it to know God in a true sense? What is it to know God in an intimate sense? Is it possible that we can have a personal and close relationship with God? Now, because Jesus is God in the flesh, Jesus has revealed God to us in a completely new, in a completely unique way, and he's revealed God to us in a way that demands our attention. You see, when you look at Jesus, there are no mysteries about God. When you look at Jesus, there are no shadows about God. All the questions disappear. When you see Jesus, you understand God in a new and a fresh way. In fact, Scripture tells us that apart from Jesus' entrance into this earth, there's no way that we could really see God. There's no way that we could see God apart from Jesus. This was part of God's plan. We see this in John chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. For from His fullness, Scripture says, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses... Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. No one has ever seen God apart from Jesus. But because of Jesus' time on this earth, Scripture says, we experience God's love firsthand. In the works that Jesus did, in the way that Jesus died, He showed us how much God loves us. Romans 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrates His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because of Jesus, we also know about how much God cares about us. We know about his goodness towards us. Matthew 6, verse 8, Jesus says, Your father knows what you need before you even ask him for it. We know about this by, by looking at Jesus. We also know, by looking at Jesus' life, that God does not play favorites and that God is not interested in partiality. Instead, God offers eternal life and salvation to everyone equally. You see this in the way that Jesus interacted with people. You see this in how he treated people that his society or his culture rejected. You see this in how he went out of his way to share the gospel with those that many of his culture would not have even talked to. Great movements that started by Jesus simply showing love to people who had not been loved. We see this aspect of God at work in Jesus' life. And because of Jesus... Importantly, we're not orphans anymore. Scripture says that through Jesus, you can call upon God the way that a child 
calls upon their father. And this is what God wants for us. But overall, you see that Jesus spoke God's words. He thought God's thoughts. He felt and he expressed God's emotion. And he represented his father perfectly. He revealed his father's love to us. In Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, Scripture reveals this to us. Long ago, these are the first two verses of the book of Hebrews, which has a very deep theology about this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he created the world. So God has spoken to us in a few different ways as we saw, but when he speaks with, through Jesus, he speaks with a finality. So that's the first reason Jesus came to the earth, to reveal God's love to us. The second reason, Scripture says, Jesus came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. He came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. What do I mean by this? Well, we know that Jesus' entrance into this world was partly for the purpose of overcoming and conquering the plans of Satan, which Scripture describes as the greatest enemy of the kingdom of God. You understand, our Lord Jesus' birth was a significant, important turning point in the battle between good and evil. It was a, a significant turning point in the battle between God and Satan. And what do we know about the Lord is that he never loses any war that he engages in. He never loses. He only wins. And the battle with Satan is no exception to that. This is spelled out for us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. This is a short verse that's often overlooked when people think about this, but scripture says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Because of Satan's strengths and because of the widespread nature of sin and temptation, you have to understand, Satan's power had grown and grown and grown throughout creation all the way back to the very Garden of Eden. Practically everything in the world, it seems, bows to Satan. It seems that there's no area where Satan doesn't exercise a good deal of control or at least a good deal of influence. Satan is very good. He's a master at drawing people away from God. He's a master at attempting to interfere with people's relationships with God. Scripture says, in fact, he's so powerful that if you hear the gospel message of salvation and it lands on your heart, but it doesn't take root, says that Satan can come and actually snatch the word away from you before you have a chance to receive it. This is how powerful he is. Every time that we go against God's will for our lives, every time we sin, we're doing what Satan wants us to do. Now, because Satan is this powerful, and because of all the resources that he has at his disposal, Satan is referred to in Scripture as the prince of the power of the air. He's been working throughout, king, throughout history to build a kingdom for himself. He's been working to build a kingdom of darkness that opposes the kingdom of God. He's been working with his own schemes, his own plans to thwart the purposes of God. But Jesus came to this earth to make sure that Satan's efforts count for nothing. Jesus came to this earth to make sure that Satan's efforts were not worthwhile. He came here to dissolve Satan's kingdom, to destroy it, to conquer it, now, how did he accomplish this? Well, he accomplished it in a few different ways. We know from Scripture that Satan's kingdom is built upon what? Lies and deception, right? That's all the works of Satan, lies and deception. Scripture even calls him the father of lies. So he deals in lies. What did Jesus say about himself? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Wherever you see a lie from Satan, you see a true statement from Jesus. When Jesus was on trial before Pontius Pilate in John chapter 18, what does he say to him? He says, the reason that I was sent to this earth, Jesus says, was to testify to the truth. He says, everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me. He countered Satan's kingdom with truth. Jesus doesn't just speak the truth. Scripture says he is the truth. He is the essence of truth. Satan's kingdom is also built upon death and destruction. Sin is built upon death. Sin leads to death. Scripture says, sin can produce nothing but death and pain. Well, what did Jesus do about that? He conquered death when he came back from the dead. He conquered the grave. He showed that death couldn't hold him back. He showed that he was powerful over everything, including death. Before Jesus was crucified, he tells us 
One of the reasons that I came to this earth was to undo the works of Satan. Look with me at John chapter 12, verses 31 and 33. Jesus says, Now is the judgment of the world, and now the ruler of the world will be cast out. That's Satan. He says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. He says, It's time for me now to cast out the one who seems to have all the power in this world, the ruler of the world. He says, I came to this earth to destroy the works of the devil. So he came to reveal God's love. Christmas says that he came to, re- to destroy the works of the devil. Third reason, Jesus came to this earth to fulfill God's promises. Came to this earth to fulfill God's promises. Now one of the ways that you can know for sure the reliability of Scripture is all the promises that God makes, and then all the ways that he keeps those promises. You don't find that in any other belief system. You don't find that in any other religion. You only find that in the Christianity of the Bible. The greatest promise that God ever made is that he would send his son into the world, that it is through, the, through his son that he would save the world, it's through his son that he would redeem the world, and that anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus would be saved. There is no greater promise than that. That's why Jesus came to this earth. Now, you know this, one of Jesus' main titles is the title of Messiah. No one else can be called that, only Jesus, Messiah. Messiah means anointed one or chosen one. It's through Jesus' life that God had decided that he would meet all of the needs that we have. God said through the Old Testament prophets, before Jesus was born, before Jesus came to this earth, he said to the Old Testament prophets, hey, as much sin as there is in the world right now, and as much as things seem to be going astray, I am going to send one who through his life will set everything right. The government will be upon his shoulder. He's going to set everything right. This was a promise about Jesus' entrance into the world. And in fact, every promise that God ever made throughout the Old Testament, in some way, it built towards Jesus' time on this earth, and it was fulfilled by Jesus' time on this earth. This is part of the reason that he came to this earth. When Jesus was born, and as he lived his life, and when he gave his life, he was fulfilling promises that God had made generations or even thousands of years before. He was fulfilling promises. The manger that we celebrate, that's become such a symbol to us, the manger is a sign of God's enduring faithfulness and also God's commitment to keeping his word. There are many instances in the Old Testament where God's plan is revealed. Perhaps one of the most important expressions of this promise is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And here, the Lord is speaking to King David through Nathan the prophet. Look with me at 2 Samuel 7, verses 16 and 17. The Lord says to David, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. You see, David was the first and one of the most important kings of all of Israel. David was so critical to God's plan for the nation of Israel that anyone who ruled after David as king had to be from David's line, had to be a descendant of David. This is called in scripture the Davidic line or the line of David. You had to be from the the line of David if you wanted to have a legitimate claim to the throne of Israel. No one outside of it could claim that. When the Lord established this promise, you know, when he said to to David, hey, this is how it's going to be, this was called a covenant, right? This is actually called the Davidic covenant. It's a covenant that God entered into with David. He says to David, your throne is going to be established forever. It will never be overthrown. And there would always be a descendant of yours sitting upon the throne of Israel. Let me tell you, The only person who could possibly fulfill this condition, the only person who could be the fulfillment of this promise, is our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, fully God, fully man. As a man, Jesus was a physical descendant of David, meaning he had a claim to the throne. As God, Jesus is capable of ruling from the throne forever, because he's not limited by time like we are. It had to be Jesus to keep this promise fulfilled. And part of the reason that Jesus came to this earth was to see to it that this promise was granted. This was acknowledged in Jesus' birth. You know, Jesus was no ordinary baby. Look with me at the angel's announcement in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. 
And behold, the angel says to Mary, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus fulfilled this promise in a way that only he could. He reigns forever over the throne of David. Now, what this means for us today is that we serve a God who keeps his promises. We serve a God whose word is impeccable. We serve a God who can be counted on to do what he says he's going to do. So this Christmas, as we think about this, we've got to remember that God is worthy not only of being celebrated, but he's worthy of all our confidence, all our faith, all of our hope. There is nothing better than what God has granted us. And there is nothing better than the fulfilled promises of God. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who we proclaim to you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. Every promise of God is yes in Jesus Christ. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise of God. All the promises of God find their yes in him. And let me tell you, Christmas is no exception to that. Christmas is the promise of God. And finally, I'll leave you with this. Fourth reason Jesus came to this earth. To save us from our sins. You see that? I saved the best for last. (laughs) To save us from our sins. This is the most important reason that Jesus came to this earth. To save us. We need saving, and Jesus is the Savior. You see, we cannot understand the beauty of the manger in Bethlehem if we don't also grasp the power of the cross at Calvary. The manger and the cross go together in an inescapable manner. They cannot be separated from one another. You see, above all, this is the purpose for which the Son of God came into our world. This is why he took on flesh. This is why he dwelt among us. This was his primary purpose in life. And saving us from our sins is the main thing that Jesus set out to accomplish. As we see from Scripture, the gospel message of salvation, the gospel of Jesus, as the owners were sharing earlier, the gospel of Jesus is what saves us. The gospel of Jesus is is how we get eternal life. It's how we get our sins forgiven. It's how we get welcomed into the kingdom. So Mary, before she even became pregnant, the angel explained to Mary, hey, this is what's going to happen. This is what you can expect. She knew what was going to take place. Look with me at Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 21 here. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this statement. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. She will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In this life, There is nothing more important than being saved from your sins. There is nothing more freeing, more important than having your sins forgiven and being declared righteous before the Lord on account of Jesus. And this is the basic need that we all have. God saw this need. He sent his son Jesus to provide the cure. You see, lots of times when we read the Bible, especially when we read the Gospels, we focus in on details of Jesus' life. We say, oh man, he preached this incredible sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, this was incredible. Or, oh man, he released this really powerful teaching. We study his teachings, we study his preaching, we try to apply them to our lives, we focus on his miracles. Oh man, can you imagine when he fed the 5,000 with just some fish and some bread? Or, wow, he really put the religious leaders in their place. He really exposed them for what they were. Man, that's so powerful. We focus in on Jesus' life and we realize that while he did those miraculous things, and that's really incredible stuff, that was not the reason that he came to earth. He didn't come just to preach great sermons. He didn't come just to be the best teacher ever. He didn't come just to feed people. He didn't come just to heal people. He came to earth so that we could be saved from our sins. And everything that Jesus did pointed him 
to when we were saved from our sins by him. You see, as we saw, Jesus lived a perfect sinless life. He never did anything wrong, never said anything wrong. He never thought anything wrong. Everything he did was perfectly honorable. Then he laid down his life willingly for us upon the cross. And then he miraculously rose from the dead three days later. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down willingly. He says, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it back up again. This is why he came to this earth. God did not send Jesus to deny sin. God didn't send Jesus to cover up sin. Denials and cover-ups were never part of God's plan. Instead, through Christ, God forgave sin. He released us from sin. We have deliverance from sin. We have deliverance from guilt. Jesus put away sin entirely. And we have true salvation through what Jesus did. Look with me in closing here at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 through 25. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Our religious actions cannot put away sin. Feeling sorry, practicing self-denial, clean living, those things cannot put away sin. Sin is a stain on our soul that can only be washed away by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Jesus alone can put away our sin, and that is really the miracle of Christmas. If we don't see Christmas through the reality of the power of the gospel message, then we don't understand it. If we think the most amazing thing about Jesus is just his birth, or if that's all we come to think of him as, if we don't see what he accomplished with his life, if we don't see what he accomplished with his death and his resurrection, then we actually miss the message of Christmas. And I'll leave you with this promise from Jesus in John chapter 10. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them from my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So why did Jesus come to this earth? He came to reveal God's love to us in a new way. He came to destroy the works of the devil and the kingdom of darkness. He came to fulfill God's promises, and he came to save us from our sins. Let's close in prayer. Father, we love you. We can never thank you enough for sending your son to this earth. We can never thank you enough for his perfect, sinless life, his perfect sacrifice, and the offer of salvation that you extend to everyone. Lord, please help us to live lives that please you. Please help us to reflect on this wondrous miracle, not just today, but every day of the year. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Please join us uh, downstairs for a reception. We've got cake. Also, I neglected to... I neglected to announce this. Uh, this is the last day to contribute to the cheer, cheer kits, cheer bags. Uh, if you have not done so and you'd like to drop off a trinket card for our shut-ins, please do so. Thank you.